Hi, everyone. Hold on to your horses and tighten up your britches. Today, I have yet another set of shocking stories that are sure to make your head spin. You might even learn the truth about something that makes it impossible for you to sleep tonight. So get yourself comfortable, grab your favorite drink, and cozy up with that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. You know how everybody has a bucket list of things they want to do before they die? Well, I wish I'd left this off of mine. I'm a teacher at a local community college here in Denver, but my mom's family were from down south. One of the cool things about being a teacher is that you get summers off. So about 10 years ago, I decided to go to Louisiana on summer break. I wanted to meet some of the family I only knew through yearly Christmas cards. My great aunt Marjorie offered to let me stay with her so I could save money on a hotel. She lived out in Slidell, close to the Mississippi border and smack in the middle of Bayou Country, so that was perfect. Aunt Marjorie acted like we had known each other for years and she was a lot of fun to talk to. She knew everybody in town, or they knew her, and she wasn't shy about offering her opinions. She sure let me know what that opinion was when I told her I was going to take a swamp tour. In fact, she got really touchy about it saying one of my cousins could take me if I wanted. I thought that was weird, but when I asked why she didn't like my plan, all she'd say was that she had heard the company had a new guide. The swamp demanded respect, and I should go with a knowledgeable guide. Well, I thought that was sensible, so I double-checked to make sure that I would be on a tour with someone experienced. No problem, they assured me. I'd be on the boat with their best guide. So the day came and I headed off to the tour office on the Pearl River. I was actually really excited. I was finally going to spend all day experiencing a place that had fascinated me for years. The tour group I was with had about seven other people in it, mostly out-of-town tourists like me. I was finally going to spend a day experiencing a place that had fascinated me for years. The tour group I was with had about seven other people in it, mostly out-of-town tourists like me. Check-in was fine, and I had already signed the We Won't Hold You Responsible If I Die waivers online, so the process was fast. Everything went well, up until it came time to meet our guide. The guy who came out did not look like more than a kid. The receptionist introduced him as Dean and said that he would be taking us around the river. Now, I didn't want to make a fuss over something I was sure was a minor thing, but I'd also promised my great aunt that I would go with an experienced riverman. I quietly pulled the receptionist aside and I asked her how much time Dean had had on the river. She told me not to worry, that Dean was fully qualified as a pilot and had all the safety briefings. Well, I figured that was the best I could do, and if my aunt asked, I would tell her the company assured me the pilot knew what he was doing. Dean really did seem to know what he was doing, and I felt a lot better about breaking my so-called promise to Aunt Marjorie. He piloted us up the river toward Honey Swamp. It was weird how relaxing everything was. The water lapping at the boat sides, the moss hanging down from the trees along the riverbank. It was the best. Dean told us he knew a good spot to see alligators, which made everybody excited. He said he would take us there after lunch. We stopped to eat in a sunny, wide part of the river. Dean pulled out the sandwiches and lemonade the tour company had packed. I think it was the whole experience that made everything taste so good. Once we finished, it looked to be a little later than I had thought. Or maybe that was because we were headed into the deeper part of the swamp. I don't know. But Dean was a good tour guide. He piloted the boat close to the shoreline when we saw wild pigs, and he let us watch them root around at the edge of the water. Dean kept up a steady stream of stories about the swamp. He also talked about the stories of the ghosts of the bayou, the people who have gone into the swamp and never came back, the stories of eyes glowing in the dark and of claw marks over ten feet high on trees. Logically, I knew that most of these stories would have simple explanations, like alligators or snakes or just unfortunate timing and people who weren't prepared. But with the atmosphere of the swamp itself pressing on us, the stories seemed a lot creepier. Getting to the good place for alligator watching seemed to take a little longer than I thought it would, but that was alright. Once Dean cut the motor, within a few minutes I could see ripples under the water, 
and eye ridges coming up to the surface. Dean opened a compartment and pulled out some poles and a cooler full of meat scraps. He baited the poles with the meat and he handed them out so we could feed the gators. In spite of the slightly creepy atmosphere watching these Jurassic rejects launch themselves out of the water like living torpedoes was incredibly cool. They snatched the meat right off the tips of the poles. When we'd gone through the meat in the cooler, Dean then tried to start the motor, but the motor refused to turn over. The other tourists started muttering nervously, but our guide didn't seem too worried. He said he just needed a few minutes. The alligators were still milling around the boat, but with no meat being dangled over the sides, they were starting to vanish into the water. There was so much silt churned up that the river started to look like chocolate milk. And that was when I noticed that without a motor to hold us steady, the current had drifted us towards one of the banks of the river. I started taking pictures of the trees on my phone as we got closer, and the light was starting to shift, and the moss and the twisted branches were starting to look very eerie. Something moved in the underbrush. I could hear the crunching. Whatever it was, it was big. Maybe it was a female gator coming away from a nest. I hoped it wasn't breeding season. The sound came again, and I thought about asking Dean what he thought it was but I wanted him to fix the boat more than I wanted to know what the animal was, so I kept quiet. I wasn't the only thing quiet. Suddenly I realized that there were no more bird sounds. The rest of the group noticed how silent everything was too, and stopped talking. I started to think of all those stories about ghosts on the bayou and the people who never came back from the swamp. There was a loud crackle of branches, and I saw Dean look up from the control wiring he was messing with, I remember the look on his face. I don't know what was in the tree line, but I knew that Dean did, and it wasn't good. Suddenly the boat motor chugged to life. Our guide got up as calm as could be and told us to hold on, and then he threw the thing into gear and he piloted us away from the bank and toward the middle of the river. When I turned back to look at the river bank, something was in the water. At first I thought it was an alligator, but if it was, it was a big one and the head was wrong. More like a lizard? No lizard is that large, though. It looked more like a dinosaur, which I knew wasn't possible. I moved away from the rest of the tour group to see if I could get a better look, and it rose out of the water. No, it stood up. It had shoulders like a human, but it was very clearly scaly. And that head? I looked around to see if any of the other tourists saw it, but no one was freaking. Did I really see what I thought I saw? When I looked back at where I had seen it, the thing was gone, but there was a ripple in the water that was coming straight for us. It followed us for about a minute, but whatever it was, it couldn't swim as fast as the boat was moving, and then the ripple vanished. We got back to the dock safely and I went home to Aunt Marjorie, and the next day, I flew home. It's been a few years since then, but I still have no real idea what I saw that day. All I know is, I'm staying in Denver, far away from any swamps from now on. A few years ago, I was stuck in a rut. Single, living alone in a dinky little apartment in a bad part of town, taking a few classes at the local community college, and working two jobs I hated just to make ends meet. One of them wasn't too bad, really. It was a part-time gig at a local after-school program a couple of times a week. It was geared towards teens, so at least they weren't too bratty. I actually still worked there up until a couple of months ago. The other job just plain stunk. I was the night receptionist at a crappy motel. I don't know how, but I swear all the weirdos and creeps and entitled people in the area must have had a conference or something because I barely had a single decent customer interaction my entire time working there. Yeah, after two years, I was more than ready to quit. I managed to find work at a pizza place. Still not ideal, but much better than what I had, so I put in my two weeks notice. Those final two weeks were plain awful. Maybe it was being so close to the finish line that made it seem worse in comparison, but I honestly think that my manager also made it harder out of spite. During my last week, she insisted that I work a few extra days since I was leaving. I don't think she was supposed to be able to do that, but she paid me overtime, and I needed the money, 
so I didn't make a fuss. After all, in just a few short days, I would be out of there for good. Some of the extra shifts were on the same days that I had my other job at the school. As a result, I barely slept that week since I had classes in the morning, the school job in the afternoon, and then the motel job all night long. By the Thursday of that last week, I was pretty much completely burnt out. I got off work at around 4 in the morning, hoping to get in a few hours of sleep before I had to get ready for school. Anyway, I got off work like normal and I went to take my normal route home. It was closed for road work. I couldn't believe my bad luck. According to GPS, the fastest detour was this weird loop around the suburbs and back into the city. There was a decent stretch where it was just this back road through an area without much in it. I guess it was because those roads would be pretty much deserted at any time of day, let alone before dawn. No stoplights, no traffic, barely any streetlights even. I was not happy, let me tell you. What a perfect way to end such a horrible week. I just kept repeating, just one more day, just one more day, just one more day, like a mantra. Obviously, I was seriously tired. I started seeing strange shapes like flashing shadows out of the corners of my eyes, but I just brushed it off at first, just the darkness in my tired brain playing tricks on me. But then it started to get more frequent, and I clearly saw a dark shape in my rearview mirror. It looked like a huge bird gliding behind me. I started to freak out a little. I tried to tell myself it was just paranoia from sleep deprivation, but I could see it right there. It even left and came back a few times. And then I tried to tell myself it was just a big hawk or something, but it was clearly tailing me, specifically. I tried swerving across the road and it stayed in line with my car. Now I'm no avian expert, but that is not normal bird behavior. And just when I was really starting to freak, it was gone. It just sort of swooped up out of my mirror's view. I tried to catch my breath, it was really just gone. I made a plan to go straight to bed when I got home so that when I woke up, I would be able to tell myself that it was just a weird dream or hallucination. And then I saw the dark shape again. I watched it get bigger and bigger in the mirror. Not only was it not gone, but it was coming straight at me. I hit the gas hard, but the thing kept pace easily. It actually disappeared from the mirror as it flew faster than my car which was well above the speed limit at this point. I felt the car even shiver as it zoomed past me. It kept diving down at me, flying back up and circling around before doing it again. It never actually hit me, but I knew that it wasn't because it couldn't. It was playing with me like a terrifying game of cat and mouse. Now at the time I was saving up for a convertible, but in the meantime I was settling for an old Toyota Camry with a sunroof. I liked to drive with the sunroof open to make me feel a little better about not having a convertible. On this particular day, it was a little chilly, so I had the sliding cover open, but the actual window was closed. I'm pretty sure my heartbeat was louder than the road at this point, but it's about to get worse. The bird thing dove at my car again, but this time it didn't stop short. I just remember flashes of this part, the shape in the mirror, and then the shadow overhead. And then there was this sharp thud on the roof and the car shook. I looked up through the sunroof just in time to see the outline of what looked almost like a person crouching. I full on panicked. I hit the gas and I jerked the wheel, anything to get that thing away from me. And that was the only thought in my mind, get away. And then the car shook again as the thing pushed off of it. I swerved, spun out, landed in the grass just off the road. I wasn't hurt, but my nerves were destroyed. I waited until the sun came up before going the rest of the way. I know that sounds dumb, but I was literally frozen in fear. It never did come back, but even if it had, I'm not sure if I would have been physically able to move from that spot. Maybe this sounds like the delusional rantings of a sleep-deprived college student, but I swear it was not a hallucination. I don't think it's possible to dream up the knowledge of what it's like to honestly fear for your life like that. And sure, I made it out without a scratch on me, but the thing that really keeps me up at night, even to this day, is the fact that whatever that thing was, it could have got me, but it chose to let me go. 
The only reason you are hearing this story is because it didn't feel like killing me that day. That's creepy. I'm not an outdoorsy person. Besides going to the beach to lay out, I cannot stand being around a lot of bugs or without solid Wi-Fi. My friends are totally the opposite, though. A few years ago, they convinced me to give camping a chance. I didn't want to, but they promised to do everything, and all I would need to do is eat, swim, and sleep, so I begrudgingly agreed. Where we went was in Transylvania County, North Carolina, where, specifically, I couldn't say, and really, I don't have any desire now to ever know. I can admit the drive to the trail's parking was beautiful, so was the initial hike to where we would be camping. It was summer, so everything was lush and green. We made camp, and everything was uneventful for a few days. To be honest, I was bored out of my mind as day three approached. I had no idea how I would last for the whole week. And that's when one of my friends suggested hiking toward some waterfall that they had heard was off one of the trails. At first, I declined because who really wants to hike four miles for a waterfall that might not exist? But the alternative to stay by myself wasn't really comforting, so I grabbed a water bottle and some snacks and headed out with them. It took about an hour to get to this supposed hidden trail. None of us were really sure if what we found was even the right one, but we took the branched path anyway. The sun was high, and it was so humid, but I won't lie, it was incredibly beautiful. Even the swarms of flying bugs along the way didn't sour my mood too much. We'd been hiking down a path one of my friends called a game trail that animals used. It was pretty overgrown, surrounding the worn, thin line that we walked single file along. As another hour turned into two, we still hadn't come across any waterfalls or even streams when we finally reached a small clearing along the path. The clearing couldn't have been more than maybe ten feet across. We stopped for a minute as everyone was sort of deciding if it was worth it to continue, and that's when one of my friends first smelled it. It took me a minute to notice because I can admit I wasn't in the best shape and catching my breath took a little longer than I would have liked. The smell was putrid, though, and it stung my nostrils. It slowly filled the air around us, too. One of my friends suggested a skunk, but another one said no. They said it smelled like something was dead. This made us all very quiet. My friend looked unsettled and was glancing around for signs of what it could be. And that's when we first heard the whooping noise. That's the closest way I can describe it. It came in bursts, some short, but others drawn out like some twisted language that none of us understood. There was no time for us to do anything but share scared looks when we heard trees falling ahead of us on the path, a path that led further out of the clearing. In a moment of awareness, I realized I couldn't hear anything else but the sound of trees snapping. We were all so scared, we didn't make a sound. Whatever was knocking down the trees was getting closer. So was the whooping noise. My friends and I were frozen still, and that's when I felt one of their hands grab me and pull me back down the trail that we had originally come along. I asked what was happening, but all they said was, We have to go. That thing is huge. We hurried as fast as the path allowed, being chased by whoops and snapping trees the whole way until we got back to where the trail originally branched off. Most of us needed time to catch our breath by then. And that's when one of my friends screamed. I turned to look where they were pointing, and it was back down the path that we had just left. It couldn't have been more than 50 yards back, but we saw it just staring at us. Close to 10 feet tall, covered in dark brown hair with a lighter colored face, it had dark eyes and sharp teeth protruding from its mouth, and it looked like a huge gorilla that stood on two legs. We were staring in shock when the wind blew and we smelled that putrid stench from before. And then it snarled. None of us stuck around to wait. We were running and pushing and shoving as we headed back to our campsite. It felt like it took forever, but we finally made it. And that's when we saw something that made us decide to leave right then. Three of our tents had been torn and crushed. 
Several fallen trees that were all pretty thick had been twisted and impaled on top of them. My friend said to just ditch the gear and let's leave, and we did just that. The sun was starting to set when we reached the parking lot. One of my friends said that they would contact the local rangers later. We all just wanted to get out of those woods. The car ride back to the city was full of Bigfoot talk, and sometimes my friends called it a skunk ape. We had no idea how to know what it was we saw. I don't really even want to know. I haven't been camping since. I'm sure you're not surprised, even with more invitations. Some places are just better left alone because you never really know what lurks deep in Mother Nature. Even safe in my apartment at night with the doors locked, camera down the hall, and the alarm on, I still see that beast when I close my eyes sometimes. The nightmares don't happen as often now, but I will gladly take busy traffic and fast food 24 hours a day over seeing that thing ever again. All the biggest land speed events take place on the Bonneville Salt Flats. The smooth terrain and the moisture in the surface make the salt flats ideal for races and land speed tests. It takes a year of considerably bad weather to get these events canceled. It isn't unheard of, though, especially since the surface of the flats started contracting. The area is getting smaller. The crust is getting thinner. Brine is dumped into the flats each winter in order to keep the conditions optimal, but the program isn't perfect. Each year, surveyors sponsored by motor companies and investors trek the flats in search of imperfections. The crust can be too muddy, too brittle, too thin. But this year, there was a new issue. Heavy rainfall in the surrounding area brought down mudslides from the mountains and onto the salt flats. The other surveyors and I had to determine whether or not the mud could be cleared in time to provide a stable surface for the year's races. But we found a different problem. In the weeks leading up to our investigation, Salt Lake City was reporting an increase of wild animal sightings. Predators were wandering disturbingly deep into the city. This wasn't too surprising at the start. Wildlife had been forced out of the mountains due to the mudslides and they were searching for new means of survival. We were told to keep an eye out and we left it at that. None of us were worried about running into a coyote or a black bear. We knew we could scare them away if we had to. I was the second surveyor to go out that season. The first investigator was kind enough to provide me a copy of his report before he sent it out to the company that he worked for. I had a different employer to answer to, so I had to make my own investigation. Using his findings as a guide, I was able to seek out the problem areas almost immediately. My initial findings weren't promising. Even if we could clear the mud and create a flat surface for the races, so much moisture had run into the ground that the stability of the crust was compromised. I kept searching. If I could discover a large enough area that was clear of the debris, I could suggest an alternate track location to my employer. I drove a few miles in my ATV and got out to check the earth again. It was still too wet. This time, however, I wasn't alone. There were footprints in the mud. I mistook them for bear tracks at first, figuring the peculiar shape was due to an injury that the animal maybe had sustained during the mudslides. I followed the tracks until the mud thinned, where I could see more clearly and determine the shape of the animal's print. It was wide and deep-set in the heel, spaced so far apart that the animal was likely running when it left the tracks. The footprint alone was nearly as long as my forearm and there were five human-like toes at the front. The first surveyor was pranking me. That's what I figured. There wasn't another option in my mind. I logged the rest of my findings and I began my journey back to my vehicle. I'd only followed the prints a quarter mile or so, and when I turned around, I had a clear view of what was waiting for me. It was standing on its hind legs, towering above the roof of my vehicle. I thought it must be a bear, larger than any black bears I'd heard of. Its fur was thick and its shoulders were broad, and it was looking right at me. It must have thought that I was lost, because it stared at me for a while, with a strange look on its face, like why was I there? I watched its eyes blink slowly and thoughtfully, 
It blinked like a human blinks, and it looked at me like it was thinking. My job was done, though. All I wanted in that moment was to get out of there. I'd been prepared for a coyote, not the giant thing waiting for me. I took the key fob from my pocket and I activated the alarm on my vehicle. The animal shrieked and swatted the window with one of its massive arms. I heard the glass crack like dry leaves in the fall. And then it turned to run and it sprinted away in the direction that I'd began my journey. I'd never seen a creature run upright like that, ever. I got into my driver's seat and I watched the animal through my windshield. The terrain was still flat enough that I could see it run for more than a mile. And then eventually the shape blipped out on the horizon, obscured by the glint of the sun on the salt bed. I thought about chasing it, but then I decided that I would rather get out of there in one piece. I returned to Salt Lake City and I filed my report, complete with a warning to local authorities that I had seen a giant animal out on the flats. They didn't ask questions. They just told me it was a bear. I checked with the rest of the survey team that year. A few of them saw the tracks. None of them could identify the source. When the races were canceled due to the mudslides, that became the story of the year. No one talked about my sighting or about the animal encounters happening in Salt Lake. Enough time has passed now that I think I can start talking about my encounter again. Something was chased out of the mountains by the rain. It must have gone back, right? There's no way the creature could go undetected on that flat terrain for so long. What do you think it was? I mean, what kind of bear runs upright? I've recommended that the land speed events all be canceled until the beast can be found and identified. Who knows when it might come down next? Who knows what kind of damage it could do to a crowd of spectators? A long, long time ago, We're talking decades. I lived in the remote mountain town of Costilla, New Mexico. It was a small town. My family had lived there for generations, and the house I lived in was the house that my grandparents lived in. In small towns, everybody knows everybody. And being that our family had always lived there, I really did know everyone. So that's what makes the events that occurred very unusual. It all started with strange things being left on our doorstep. Things like unusual bottles of liquid and broken glass. Sometimes we would find that someone had left chalk cycles or drawings in the sand outside our home. It was obvious that whatever was happening was intentional, that someone had purposely left these things for us to find. But what we didn't know was why, and that totally creeped me out. I didn't mention my worries to anybody outside of the family. The things that were happening were just so unusual, and I didn't know who I could trust. Our town was small, but very religious. Everybody in town was Catholic, so every single person would be seen wearing rosaries. Nobody left home without them. So as the strange things kept happening, I refused to go anywhere without my rosary, even when I was home. Time would come and go, and so would the strange items. We were very scared of what could happen next. Were these omens? Were they symbols of what was to come? Eventually, we found something far more unsettling. On the day it all happened, I remember it was a nice day outside, so I had wanted to open the windows and get some housework done. I had laundry to do, the house needed a good dusting, and a friend had brought us some lovely tomato plants to put in the garden. So that day I did a lot of the indoor work and I moved then to the outside garden. I wanted to get the tomato plants in the ground as soon as possible, but I still had a lot of cleaning up to do in the garden beds first. I anticipated being out there for some time, and I was. I had spent three good hours out there until I finally stumbled upon them. I was at the side of my house and I was clearing up some debris out of the pots and the beds, I moved towards the windowsill as I had some pots and a small bed near the window. The window went straight into the kitchen. I had spent hours at that window every day cooking meals and washing dishes, so if something was left there, I would have noticed immediately. But I didn't, because when I got up to clean that windowsill, I found five small figures. Each of the figures was about three inches tall, and each had what appeared to be human hair actual human hair, 
and looked like people I knew, my four siblings and myself. I could recognize the clump of my hair from a mile away because of the unique curl that it had, and I knew without a doubt that this doll looked like me and had my hair. I immediately went to my siblings and told them what I found. We all agreed that the best thing we could do was to burn the dolls. So that night, we lit a bonfire, we threw the dolls in, we made a grand night of it, but I suppose the celebration was a bit too soon. When my brother went to put out the fire, he realized that the dolls had not been affected by it. Not one bit. It was as if the dolls were never touched by the fire. I know it's hard to believe that the little dolls made of wood would not have been burned, but trust me, I don't want to believe it either, but it happened. We knew that something beyond our understanding was happening. We knew that these dolls were intended for harm. So we buried the dolls far from our house. But then months later, my siblings and I started getting sick. One by one, we all started to fall terribly ill. We didn't know what was happening. The doctors couldn't explain it. And then my brother, a very spiritual man, suggested that we see a medicine doctor who had helped one of his friends in the past. When we went, the shaman explained that we were ill from a type of spiritual darkness. In that space with him, we felt that it was safe to describe our experiences and we told him everything that had happened. The bottle of liquid, the glass, the sigils. The man explained that those things weren't actually what was bad. We were shocked to learn that those things were there to protect us. However, the dolls were not. The dolls had a different purpose. The dolls were what was making us sick. The medicine doctor suggested leaving the dolls in the earth, that our hair was the main anchor to us, and that it would eventually decay into the earth. And with that, he performed rituals meant to help heal our spirits. I wasn't sure how much I really believed in what he did, but I was so worried that I didn't care what we did as long as it helped us get better. And miraculously, it did. Within days, we all regained our health, but we never got answers. We never found out who brought the dolls. We never found out how they got our hair. We never found out who was protecting us. All of these things, I still don't know. What I do know is that my kids and their kids have all learned. All of the generations of my family left on this earth, none of us dares to throw hair in the trash. I explained to them what happened, and I explained that the trash is the only place I can think of that demons could have found our hair. And then I have them burn their hair so that no one, no matter what their intentions are, can do again what has already been done to us. Years ago, I was an investigative journalist. I had been working on a story about the crisis with contaminated water that had occurred in 2001. Many people had gotten ill and several had died from various water pollutants, ranging from bacterial pathogens to chemical contamination. I had been scouring several locations throughout the United States, but I was focused mostly on areas including Arizona, where the outbreak seemed most prevalent. Sadly, places like Arizona and New Mexico, places with a large indigenous population, were the most likely to be affected by situations like these. Poor health care, poor resources, and more specifically, poor drinking water. A lot of my work involves interviewing and observing people involved with the process. I spoke to several heads of water treatment facilities, local government officials, and the like. None of them seemed to find the situation a pressing matter. It made me frustrated and sickened to know that so many people were allowing things like this to happen. But that rant is for another time. This story is about something far more complicated and less likely to be resolved than the water issues that were so utterly dismissed. Of course, I didn't just talk to the people who were in charge of implementing better practices for water safety. I spoke to the people who had been directly impacted by the situation. Now this meant going to various communities and seeing the conditions that they had been experiencing. I had looked at several lakes and reservoirs. I had been to many homes and I had seen my way around plenty of rural areas. So when I happened upon something unusual in the sky that late October morning, 
I was completely scared out of my mind. I had agreed to meet with a woman at her home in a rural area of Arizona. She had been sick, and so had three of her children. I felt like this story would help open the eyes of the public Seeing a mother and her young children ill due to poor water conditions might be enough to outrage the public. But I had to admit, I wasn't sure that I would be able to handle the sight. It seemed too grim for anyone. It was a story, though, and an important story that needed to be resolved. I was nervous about it all. It was a huge story, one that would stir up all sorts of controversy and emotions. I had to put my feelings in my back pocket despite the placement of my nerves, however. My hands would not stop shaking. I was driving to the woman's home. The road was harsh and bumpy, so between the road and my shaking hands, I don't know how I managed to steer the car. I do remember that the air was cool and crisp, and the leaves had started to change color. It was pretty, but the sensation of it all now makes me sick to think about it. I knew that there was a lake near the woman's home, so I wanted to make a quick stop to see if I could spot anything unusual. The lake was pretty small for being a lake. There are plenty of flies circulating the area and also a horrendous odor coming from the water. Being that this lake was one of the main sources of water for the woman's area, I wasn't surprised that the conditions would be short of decent. So I took out my camera. I snapped a few photos, and I took out my notepad to take several notes. I even had a small vial to collect samples. I wanted to make sure that I had something to take back to a lab to get tested. So as I'm doing all of this, I start to notice a strange sound from above. It sounded like wind, but not really. The sound was like a gust of wind, but more intense and shorter and rapid, sort of like the sound of a large bird with heavy wings flapping. I looked up, but I didn't see anything. The sound stopped then, so I continued examining the area. Trash was thrown around. It looked as if somebody had made an encampment of sorts, maybe somebody living off the land. As I approached the encampment, I started to hear the flapping sound again. This time, though, trees were above my head, so I couldn't see much of the sky. And this time, I didn't like how close it started to sound. It was loud and aggressive, So I was beginning to get a sense that whatever this was, I didn't think it wanted me around. I wondered if it could have been a mother eagle with a nest somewhere close by. I wanted to respect its boundaries, though, so I made my way back to the car. I sat in the car for a while while I reread some of my notes and examined some of my pictures. But as I sat there, I started to hear the sounds again. And with every whooshing noise, they seemed to get louder and more intense. At this point, I'm beginning to get scared, even despite being in my car. It sounds far too loud to be an eagle, and also, it sounds much larger. I put the key into the ignition, I turned it, and I drove off. I sped down the road, but I kept trying to peer out my window and also above to see if I could find whatever was harassing me. For quite some time, I didn't see anything, but suddenly, I noticed a strange shadow in the sky. All I got was a glimpse of it, a very quick glimpse. But what I saw absolutely did have large wings. That was definitely the source of the noises, but it was very odd. It was as if this bird or whatever, it had very long legs trailing behind it with talons attached. I'd never seen a bird with long legs like this, well, other than a flamingo, but I was certain it wasn't that. The best way I can describe what I saw was that it was a bird with human-like legs. It should have been terrifying, but I wasn't necessarily scared of it. Strangely, it didn't seem like it was threatening me. More so, I felt like it was protecting me, keeping me safe from having been in that area. Hi Lilith, thanks for taking on my story. I have a sighting an encounter, if you will, that I need help figuring out. I haven't talked about it much except to a few people, and one of them referred me to your channel and said it's the kind of thing you might be interested in. So, for reference, I live in Maryland. We have a lot of old ports and lighthouses along our state's coast, and some of them have been turned into tourist attractions or public museums. 
things like that to show our state's history. I'm a historian, and I recently got a job at one of those lighthouses. The one I work at is called Martin's Shoal, and it's been decommissioned since the 30s. It's one of the lesser-known locations, and part of my job is improving the visitor experience, as well as making a catalog of our archived materials. There's a lot of stuff to go through, so it's kept me pretty busy. Now, Martin's Shoal is a few hours away from the nearest city. The other staff and I actually live here for a few days out of the week. It's cool because it's pitch black out at night as there's no light pollution, and it's dead quiet. So the weird stuff started happening about three months ago. I remember that on the first day it started, it was a little after 11 o'clock at night. When I looked out over the ocean, I saw these white, faint lights in the distance, near the horizon. Now, there is this little string of islands just off Martin's Shoal. They're close enough that they used to lead to a few shipwrecks back in the day, but they've never been inhabited. I could tell that those lights were clearly coming from the direction of the islands, but at first, I doubted myself, and I assumed that I had to be seeing something wrong, because I knew there was no one out there. So, since it wasn't a big deal at the time, I didn't mention it to anybody. But then, the same thing happened a few nights later. I was with another staff member, this time Brian. He had been working there for a few years. We got to talking, and Brian told me that he had seen things out there as well. A couple of weeks before I arrived, he thought he saw a ship dock at the island. We told our supervisor about it, but it didn't go too far after that. It all seemed really weird to me. It didn't settle properly because we would have been told if there were any tourist activities on the island. Those are the sorts of things that we would try to upsell to visitors. All in all, if I thought about it, the whole thing was starting to seem off, but I didn't have time to focus on it. It's not like I had any way to get out and investigate the island anyway. And soon after that, the shoal hit a busy period. We had a full run of tours and school field trips. It was a real all-hands-on-deck sort of time. But then, one night after things had calmed down a bit, Brian and I were out on the beach. We couldn't see anything over the water, though, because it was too dark at that point. But all of a sudden, I heard this loud splashing. Clearly, somebody was out there splashing about in the water. And it sounded like somebody big had to be to be making that kind of noise. The water around the lighthouse is a no-swim zone, and we didn't want anybody to get hurt, so Brian and I grabbed our flashlights and went to see who it was. As we approached the water and were able to see better, we watched as this large, black shape climbed out of the water. My flashlight caught it, and I swore I saw a muzzle and a pair of big, red eyes. But all I was focused on was its lips that were curled up to growl at us. I was just staring at its teeth like an idiot because this thing was some sort of demonic wolf creature, and I was shocked, stupid. Brian grabbed me and we ran back to the staff house. We locked all the doors and the windows and we were both jittery nervous and on the edge for the rest of the night. I didn't know whether to tell the rest of the staff or to just leave it alone. We talked about what to do. But Brian was worried for everybody's safety and he had a point. Morton's Shoal was two hours from the nearest hospital, and that creature had been huge, and it was clear that it could easily overtake any one of us. As soon as it was daylight, which made us feel safer, Brian and I called a meeting with our supervisor. We told him what we had seen the night before and tried to make it sound as normal as possible. We didn't tell him what we really thought. We acted like it was just a wolf. Brian said that they had been sighted once every couple of years, so that would be an easy sell. To my surprise, though, our supervisor looked really nervous as we talked to him. He told us not to mention it to any of the other staff, and he even asked us to describe again what we saw. Now, just to be clear, anytime there's an animal sighting, or say a bear or something, we're supposed to call animal control. It's too high risk to be this remote and to have as many visitors as we do. But to our surprise, our supervisor wanted us to do nothing. He hadn't been my boss for long, but he had been at his job for 20 years, so I knew he took it seriously. This just wasn't like him. So now Brian and I are concerned that we had to keep quiet and we didn't know why. 
actually. The not knowing why was worse for me than the keeping quiet part. It seemed scary. And not only that, the supervisor told us to be sure to stay off the beach after sundown. That was his only solution, the only one he offered. And you know what? I listened to him. But it doesn't matter anyway because I can still see the lights coming off of those islands. And we've started to find more wolf tracks coming off the beach. I really didn't know what to do at that point. I think it might be time to move on for this job before I'm an accomplice to somebody getting hurt. Anyway, that's my story. Thank you for listening. Hi, Lilith. Something happened to me over the summer and I finally feel ready to tell the story. I live in Montana, a state known for wide open ranges, high mountains, and the best of all, trout fishing. I guess I've seen a river runs through it too many times because I spend nearly every single free moment of my time out on nearby rivers and streams fly fishing. There are about a dozen different bodies of water within an hour's drive and each one has quality trout fishing. While Montana is relatively unpopulated, some of the more popular places can get a little crowded during the busy months. Every serious fisherman has their own secluded secret spot, and I'm no exception. I found it a few years ago and have seen maybe two other people on the stream in all that time. I was there on the day that this story takes place. It's about a two-hour drive from my home in Polson, so I left the house a little bit before dawn. I had fishing buddies but never showed anyone else the secret spot. After the drive and a further hour hike, I was on the river. It was a clear day and the river's wide enough that you can see pretty far both up and downstream. I hit some of my usual spots like deep pools, downed trees, and some shallow rapids. The morning was warm and it was beginning to heat up quickly as the sun rose. Trout tend to get lethargic in warm weather and I was afraid it was going to be a waste of a day. I really didn't want to leave empty-handed so I decided to walk upstream a bit. Maybe I would find a mountain stream runoff, which would make the water in the vicinity a little cooler. I fished my way upstream, maybe two or three miles, alternating between walking along the bank and wading in the river. I had never really explored this stretch of the river before, and the land before me became wilder and more beautiful with every step. And that's saying something for Montana. Despite the captivating scenery, I caught this strange feeling that I couldn't quite seem to shake. It felt like I was walking into an area where I didn't belong. Like I had stepped back into a time when man was at the bottom of the food chain. The rocks and the boulders became more jagged and uneven, and even the trees seemed to loom larger, like towering sentinels peering down at a clumsy intruder. I did my best to ignore the feeling, and I just kept casting out, hoping my fly would get noticed. Fortunately, the water became a little shallower, and I was able to wade further out into the water and create some more casting room. It was while I was standing in the center of the river mid-cast when I noticed it. Across the river on the opposite bank, one of the trees began moving, and then another, shaking violently. I could see leaves and pine cones falling from above to the forest floor. Something was moving from deep in the forest, heading in my direction. And whatever it was, it was big enough to make a 60-foot tree shake and sway as if it was a hurricane. I yanked all my line in with my hand and I grabbed it up in a bundle. No doubt it was a tangled mess, but I had bigger problems to worry about right then. Wading through water is tough and I probably wasn't going to get back to the shoreline before this thing emerged from the other side. But what choice did I have? I turned and I came as close to a run as I could and I kept having to feel around with my feet to find my next safe stepping spot. I kept pushing forward, and I could begin hearing a massive thump, thump, coming from behind. It was getting louder with each passing heartbeat. Now terrified, I threw my $500 rod into the water, and I began taking long, risky steps, just praying that I didn't step into a hole or slip into the water. Plenty of fishermen have drowned after falling in and having their waders filled with water. I had almost reached the other bank when I heard a thunderous crash behind me. I couldn't help but turn and look. As if out of a fantasy book, this literal giant stood before me. It was at least half the height of the 50-foot pine trees. 
A patchwork garment of a dozen elk skins covered it from the waist down. This gargantuan fist held down at both of its sides seemed as if it could envelop me whole. I was somewhere between full terror and complete awe. A living creature of legend was standing in front of me. Its eyes were the size of pumpkins and they locked with mine and held my gaze. And then it opened its mouth. This was the only time in my life that I can say that I felt a noise. Inhaling a tremendous breath, the creature roared a single explosive word. Go! Mimicking the size of the creature, the single word was long and expansive. I hadn't initially comprehended that the thing had just spoken. I just stood unresponsive with my mouth open, standing in the water up to my thighs. The creature stooped and uprooted a two-ton boulder from the rocky shore. Single-handedly, it pulled that boulder back and launched it like a catapult, the stone monolith slamming into the water just ten yards away from me. Then a shower of water and rocks and wood rained down on me, and I had to cover my hands with my head. Several smaller stones ricocheted from the tossed boulder, hitting me all over, which later turned into nasty purple welts. Snapping out of my stupefaction and realizing just how threatening this situation was, I began racing towards the shoreline. Kicking my legs high out of the water, I felt like a flamingo. Back turned to the monster, I felt another impact somewhere behind me, and globs of water soaked me even further. I was breathing hard, and I felt a surge of relief when my foot hit the rocky bank. I climbed out without looking back, and I raced towards the tree line as quickly as my soaked clothing would let me. I ran thirty feet into the woods before tripping and falling face first onto the ground, and when I stood up and turned back toward the river, I could see the immense creature lumbering back into the forest on the far side of the water. I stood there watching and listening, and its loud thumps slowly faded away until I could no longer see the tips of the tree swaying from its passing. I quickly returned to my truck, and I went home. I know this sounds far-fetched, like a child's fairy tale or something from Lord of the Rings, but it happened. I thought about calling the police, or even the media, but in the end, I decided not to. This thing could have easily killed me, but all it did was chase me away. It just wanted solitude and to be left alone, something I can relate to. That's why I went there in the first place anyway, but I won't be returning to disturb it. I'm only sending this in as a message. Maybe there are things in the world, creatures and such, that should be left alone. Maybe... We just need to stop trying to find them. I don't even know where to start with this story. I mean, I was out of my element already when they sent me out of state. I was essentially just a messenger boy who delivered packages with no questions asked. I was trying to work my way through the University of Houston, and my cousin had recommended this bike messenger gig. I figured I would get into better shape and make some money at the same time. It was hard at first, just learning how to dodge the traffic, but once I got that down and learning all the streets, it was a simple matter of running up and down some stairs with my packages. That all changed, though, when they said they had a special delivery for me to make, to the North Woods of Minnesota. It was winter break, so I had the time. It didn't seem very economical to me, though, sending this city boy out to some wilderness with a package and I wasn't allowed to fly with it, so I had to drive, like, 20 hours. I guess the manufacturer had some kind of a trust issue or something. Not that I knew who the manufacturer was. All I knew was that there was some kind of shiny silver emblem on the parcel, and it seemed really heavy for its size. They said not to let it out of my sight. They paid for it, but I had to rent myself a car since my usual transportation was a bike. All they had left was a minivan. I guess a lot of people were traveling for the holidays. I was not prepared for the weather change, though. I don't know if you're familiar with Houston, but it stays in the 60s during the winter. Try going from that to 20 degrees. Who decides to live there? If you can believe it, I actually had a parka, though, from visiting my grandma who moved to Maine a few years ago. I thought she was crazy to do that, but still. My assignment was to meet some guys on the outskirts of a small town near Black Duck. I was listening to the radio on the way there, and it sounded like they had an unusual number of missing persons reports going on. 
When I got there, the guy I was meeting ended up being a cop dressed in some kind of full body armor. He's like, I hope you brought the right size. Of course, I just smiled and nodded so I wouldn't look ignorant, but I didn't know what he was talking about. He takes the package and opens it and pours out all these bullets. He's muttering the whole time about how he can't believe they still make the silver ones. Mind you, this whole time we're standing in this deserted stand of trees, freezing my butt off. He takes out then this medieval-looking firearm and proceeds to load it up. I don't know what made me ask, but I was like, have you heard of these missing persons reports? He then looked up at me, startled, and tells me to go wait in the car. So I start to head over there when I swear. I start to hear these voices in my head. It was more like a feeling, though, than a sound. Like when you feel hungry and you start going over your food options. And then suddenly I was starving like never before. Ravenous. I wanted something meaty. Like really meaty. Have you ever been hungry for a police officer? Yeah, me neither. But that was weird. So I was hunkered down in the car and I started feeling this unimaginable chill. As if I had been trapped in a freezer with no way out but this insatiable hunger wouldn't leave me. And all I could do was think about gnashing on some fleshy creature, anything, anything I could find. I restrained myself with all my strength as I gazed up at the bare branches of a tree. Something gigantic, but gray and emaciated seemed to detach itself. Its skin was barely stretched over its bones and it had these tattered lips that smiled maliciously. It then turned towards the police officer and pulled something knife-like from its side. As it approached the officer, there seemed to be something pervasive within me that egged it on. I can assure you that never before or since have I ever wished harm upon a fellow human being. It was a possession of want and starvation, and nothing seemed to matter but consumption. This creature seemed intent on slashing the flesh of that officer but he then suddenly raised his gun and fired a silver bullet where a heart should be. The thing collapsed on the ground, and it seemed to fade into the ice. Suddenly, all the hunger pangs left me, and I just felt vacant and confused. I had no idea what had just happened, and I kind of stumbled out of the car and stared down at the ground. The cop just said, Wendigo. I understood nothing, but felt this unimaginable relief. We parted ways, and as I drove away from there, I felt like I was leaving not a place, but a time. I went straight to my hotel and I laid down and turned on the news out of habit. There were no updates on the missing persons. In fact, there were barely any details mentioned at all. So there it is. I've only ever told this story to you, Lilith. Nothing I'm going to tell you is entirely verifiable but nothing I'm going to tell you is untrue, either. I'm sending this letter via an anonymous account, not because I'm worried that they already know that I'm telling you, but because if I put enough distance between my admission and them, they probably won't feel the need to do anything about this. I've worked in a government research facility since I left college. That was back in the 1990s. I was first recruited because of my background in chemistry and biology. With a statement like that, I think you can get an idea of what direction this story is going. But you'd probably be wrong. I'm not going to talk about where I worked beyond it being outside a major metropolitan city, in a place where you wouldn't expect to see a large government-funded lab. My team and I worked on what could best be described as subliminal hypnosis programming. Our job was to introduce programming into subjects without them realizing what was going on. The hypnotic programming was designed to cascade. The more the subject was exposed to the programming, the more complex the alterations we could introduce. The most important, or interesting, if you don't have a moral code, was that we could eventually change the behavior of the host organism without its conscious decision. There have been many behavioral modification experiments done over the decades. If you know what a Pavlovian response is, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But nothing has been tried on this level and magnitude 
for a few decades. If you remember the subliminal ads of the 1980s where images were embedded in other images so that the eye would pick them up, but the conscious mind wouldn't recognize them, then you'll have an idea of what our modification programs could do. Some companies wanted consumers to buy their sodas. We wanted other things. Our experiments started on smaller things, like rats. Their high levels of intelligence and adaptability made them ideal for this sort of thing. When the rat-based experiments showed promise, our team was allowed to move upward. Cats, unsurprisingly, were not responsive enough to the programming. But canine subjects proved particularly well-suited. Our baseline experiments were able to change the subject's behavior. Making a dog sit when you walk in the room is something anyone can do. But making a dog sit only when someone wearing a particular coat comes into the room? That's different. Those situations were the proof that the program worked, but that wasn't where it stopped. Before I go on, I have to stress that the facility I worked in was in a major urban area. When the program moved to the next phase, we were all relocated to an installation in the Badlands of South Dakota. Our test subjects were now people. I never knew where they came from. The research staff was discouraged from making small talk. Our job was just to run an experiment and interacting with the subjects was not going to help with that. I also must stress that we were all told that the experiments were designed to help curb addictive behavior. Exposure to the programming, delivered through a simple screen or through headphones via a music screen. That was supposed to help people with drinking problems, smoking problems, gambling problems. I thought that was an odd application because our initial tests had been designed to produce a positive behavior in an animal subject not an avoidant behavior in a human subject. But I, like the rest of the team, stayed quiet. Our livelihoods were on the line. Our initial testing went well. After several sessions, the subjects all reported aversion to the target behavior. We received more funding and more subjects. And then it all went wrong. Some of my team was sequestered for additional work. We weren't even allowed to talk to them and they were housed in a separate facility, and to say nothing of the separate workspace. The colleagues were both psychologists and social scientists. And then one of our subjects had an adverse reaction, cardiac arrest, aneurysm. The program went on hold for a few days while investigations began. I don't know what happened to him, but I do know that his body was cremated on site. I found that curious. Not only had he died of major health events, but his body hadn't been returned to any family. When I asked if anything was being done to notify any next of kin, I was told that no such person had been in the program, that no one had died. The program resumed and there were thankfully no more fatalities. However, we got better and better at layering the subliminal suggestions to create very complex behaviors that could be triggered by a particular stimulant, say, a sound or an image. These complex behaviors would immediately overwhelm the subject and override the conscious will, making the subject act in ways that they would not normally. In other words, we were creating secondary personalities that could be activated on a whim. In every experiment, errors occurred, and another one happened. This time, when the subject snapped, it was violently. One of my colleagues was killed, and four of the floor security guards died before the subject collapsed. Aneurysm. This time, our program went on hold pending another investigation, and our research was terminated. We were all disbanded, but we were kept within other government programs. While all the records were scrubbed, I suspect they still exist somewhere in the depths of the dark web. I would discourage anyone from trying to find them. You may believe me, or you may not, but looking for answers is never something that comes without a price. I know that all too well. Hi Lilith. My name is Jack, and I'm writing in about a recent Airbnb stay that my girlfriend and I booked that went really wrong. 
While it might sound like a non-paranormal experience to some people, I feel like it's worth exploring. I've heard a lot on your channel about similar situations, and I'm curious what you might think about what we saw and heard during our stay. My girlfriend Maria and I both work in healthcare, and the pandemic was, honestly, hell for us. We both got really burned out, especially Maria, since she had taken a job as a travel nurse for about six months. It ended up not working out, and she came back home to settle in at our local hospital, which is where we met and work now, but in different departments. Luckily, Maria made so much money during the travel nurse gig that we were able to set some of it aside for a vacation once things calmed down a bit. So, about a month ago, we decided to finally pull the trigger, take some time off, and get away somewhere. We live in Tucson, Arizona, so heading south to Mexico seemed like a good idea for an easy and quick five-day vacation. After looking around for a bit, we decided on Puerto Penasco, which isn't too far from us, and the area around it also had some places nearby that we wanted to check out. Even though we had some extra spending cash, I grew up frugally, and when booking our Airbnb, I kept that in mind. I ended up finding a nice condo that was away from the main resort area of the town, but still near the water. We packed up and headed out, arriving the same day. In real life, the condo was definitely a little more run down than we had expected, and missing some key features, like dish soap and extra towels. Maria and I are both pretty laid back, so we made do and just started looking around for a place to go to dinner. We wanted to avoid the really touristy restaurants, but still get some good food, so it took us a while to make a decision. Eventually, around 6.30, we agreed on a food truck that was supposedly nearby, about a 10-minute walk. The sun was starting to go down soon, and after looking at the GPS on our phones, we decided we could stick to more populated streets versus a scenic walk to the food truck. First, we had to walk out of our neighborhood and cut up a path through a sand dune area, and then we would end up in a little bay area where the food truck was parked near the water. When we arrived, there were other people around, so I wasn't too worried, and eventually we got our food and sat down on a bench to eat. We hung out in that area for almost two hours, and then at around 8.15, we decided to head back and get some sleep. Maria took the lead, and I followed. As we were coming down the sandy spots, I heard a dog start to yap in a way that made my anxiety spike. I grew up with an overprotective dog, and I recognized that bark as a kind of a warning bark. So I stopped, and I started to look around. Maria told me she felt it was fine and not to worry that we should just keep going. But within a few seconds, at least two other dogs started barking furiously. We were just about at the bottom of the dunes, and I almost tripped trying to hurry. The area is not well lit, and I just wanted to get up to the sidewalks. A car then drove by. I felt a little better. We made it about two or three streets away from the condo, and we were looking at the closed businesses as we passed, talking about which one of them we should check out tomorrow. And that's when I glanced down a side alleyway and I froze immediately, seeing a dog in the shadowed area. Maria also stopped to see what I was looking at and then held my arm a little tighter. Come on, she said. Let's just keep going. It's just a dog. But just as those words left her mouth, two more appeared in the same spot. And then another. They all looked our way, and they started walking toward us. They were only maybe a hundred feet away from us at this point. Now Maria and I did kick it up a notch, and we really started hurrying back to the condo. I was thinking that this was a pack of stray dogs following us, and I was a little worried knowing stray dogs can be aggressive. I glanced back as we got onto the road that the condo was on, and I saw that the pack of dogs was still following us. But what stood out to me was that every dog, there were five of them in total, looked exactly the same. They were huge, easily up to my hip, and I'm 5'11". I pulled on Maria's arm, and I told her to stop and look. We both stared at the dogs who were watching us with their heads lowered and their eyes literally glowing. Not that normal green-yellow reflective glow that dogs get at night, but a reddish-orange actual glow. There were other dogs nearby, but this pack of five was completely silent and still as they watched us. 
They had long bodies, long tails, and short black hair. I even noticed that one had a cropped ear. Maria and I finally got back to the condo. We let ourselves in quickly. There were street lights in this area, and we looked out from inside to try and see the dog pack again, but they didn't come out onto the street. We stayed up late, talking about the dogs and what they might have been. I'm 100% convinced that they weren't just regular stray dogs. First of all, they looked exactly the same, like clones of each other. And the red eyes are an indicator to me that we were dealing with something paranormal, not natural. In my opinion, I think we came across a pack of hellhounds, although I have no idea what they were doing in Porto Penasco. Maria didn't agree, and she still insists that we just saw a pack of strays. Either way, for the rest of the trip, we either ate close to the condo or we took a car out when we were going out at night. This was supposed to be a vacation for us to blow off steam, but I spent most of the time thinking about those supposed dogs and trying to reason out what we had seen. Eventually, we returned home, but we haven't talked about it much. But with Maria still insisting that we didn't see anything unusual, I wanted to reach out to you for other opinions. What do you think? For as long as I can remember, I've been tirelessly working for something. In high school, I wanted to get into a good university, so my grades and extracurriculars were top priority. And then it was all about working on my degree so I could get a good job. I put everything I had into my career. Not to brag, but it definitely paid off. I now enjoy a highly respected position in my field and a decent spread of achievements. But I was missing something. I couldn't tell you the last time I took time for myself. I don't know if I've actually taken a real break in the last two decades. I decided to change that. I wanted to do something life-changing and completely unrelated to work, so I planned a solo road trip around the southwestern United States. I packed a suitcase, cashed in my PTO, and just started driving. It was the freest I felt in years. I hit all the major cities, saw the sights, and experienced the beauty of nature along the way. I had planned out a path ahead of time, including where I would sleep each night. It was a mix of hotels, Airbnbs, and host families who let travelers like me stay in their houses. But there was this one weird thing that I noticed. I mean, it didn't bother me at the time. Even now, it might just be a coincidence. But in light of what ended up happening, I can't help but read into it too much. When I was in the populated areas, cities, suburbs, cute little towns, everyone was, well, as you would expect. Clerks, receptionists, everyone who dealt with people on a regular basis were friendly and polite. But in the more rural, desert areas, the people started seeming, I'm not really sure what the right word is, a bit frigid maybe. They were abnormally curt, and they seemed like they wanted nothing more than for me to get out of there, away from them. They just all kept to themselves. I didn't feel welcomed at all, and again, maybe I just am paranoid. But now I wonder if they had secrets that they didn't want a stranger to find out. Anyway, I didn't let the lack of warmth take away from my trip. This trip wasn't about making friends, so as long as they got their money and I got my bed, I was content. About halfway through the trip, I was fully in the desert for a couple of days. I had arranged to stay a night at an Airbnb. It was an adorable little house with a lot of solitude. The nearest town was a couple miles away. This was my first Airbnb on the trip. I had spent all previous nights at least around other people, either the hosts whose houses I crashed at or the staff and fellow guests at the hotels. This would be my first solo night. I was honestly very excited. I'd have a nice house all to myself with no traffic noises or city lights, just the stars and the desert and me. When I got there, I settled right in. I watched the sun go down and the stars come out. Without the light pollution of the city, the view was incredible. It got chilly at night, so I made myself some hot chocolate and I curled up with a blanket and a movie. And soon, I fell asleep. But soon, something strange happened. I woke up quite suddenly in the middle of the night and no matter what I did, I could not get back to sleep. 
I tried everything I could think of. I think that somehow my body must have sensed that something was amiss. I know this will sound cliche, but the air honestly felt, I believe, charged is the word. I just know everything felt sort of tense, like a scene in a movie when you know something is about to happen. At the time, I just assumed that I was just nervous about the trip, especially since this whole Airbnb thing was a first. I decided some fresh air would be good to clear my head. I remember looking up at the stars and being floored all over again. I know it shouldn't be possible, but I was certain they were even brighter than before. Almost unnaturally so. I was only outside for a couple of minutes before I saw a shooting star and was thrilled. I'd never seen one before, in person, only in the movies. And then I saw another. And just when I was thinking about how lucky that was, I saw a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth. Unbelievable, right? I couldn't believe my eyes or my luck. I was over the moon, but the shooting stars didn't stop. They just kept coming, and coming. And then, things got even stranger. Instead of going straight down into the horizon like normal, the stars started looping around. And soon the sky was filled with them. They had just come out of the darkness. They would fall down and then fly back around, away from the Earth. At this point, I realized those were not stars. I didn't know what they were, but even a city slicker like me knew that shooting stars don't do that. Okay, I know this part will sound insane, but please know that I'm not crazy. I'm sure I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it myself, but well, I did see it. The stars, well, the lights, kept looping around the city. They came in tighter and tighter until they formed a giant glowing circle, spinning in the sky. The circle suddenly turned bright blue, and it lit up the entire sky like lightning, but it was more than just a quick flash. Even now, I can still see that image of the entire desert glowing blue. I don't know how long it stayed there. I don't know how long I stayed watching it. It was just like time stopped. And then there was this loud cracking noise. It was sharp like a branch breaking, but as loud as thunder. And then the lights immediately went out. I woke up late the next morning. My alarm had been snoozed several times, but I had no memory of doing it. I didn't remember getting into bed that night either. What I did remember was the events of that night. My memories of the bizarre lights are extremely vivid. Even now, it seems like it was just yesterday. I never told anyone. Like I said before, my career is my life and I hold an important position in my field. I can't risk anyone thinking I'm crazy. But I just had to get this story off my chest. That night still haunts me. I'm not even sure if I want to know the truth about what I saw, but hopefully, now I'll be able to have peace. I wish I had been closer to everything that happened. I wish I knew more. If I had been closer, though, I might not have the privilege of sharing this story. They might have realized that I was there, and I saw it happen. They might not have even let me quit my job and stay alive. Up until a year ago, I worked for a very prominent corporation. My role was a small one, just delivering orders in a timely two-day fashion. I covered the northern half of a sprawling American city. I can't give out too many details, I'm sorry. Proper nouns are how people get caught. Most of my deliveries went out to businesses. Very rarely did I travel into the suburbs to make residential drops. My days were fairly routine. I arrived at the distribution center at 4 a.m., loaded my blue van, and headed into the city. Deliveries took all day to complete, and every day was basically the same. And then, one day, my routine changed, and that was the moment I knew that something was wrong. After loading my truck, I was stopped by one of my supervisors. He handed me an additional box, and he asked if I would take it around with me. There was no label, no address describing where the box was going to or coming from. It wasn't paid for by any type of postage or stamp. It was an unremarkable box, half the size of a basketball. The cardboard packaging was colored black, and I had never seen a box quite like it. 
When I asked where the package was going, my supervisor just waved me off. They assured me that it wasn't a delivery. I simply needed to carry the box with me along my route. They promised that other drivers had done so in the past. It was simply my turn, they explained. They said the box hadn't seen the northern half of the city just yet. Now the way they described that was concerning. The way they said the box hadn't seen the city. I figured they had just misspoken, but I never clarified, thinking it was just a simple mistake. In my mind, they were testing some new GPS product that would likely be installed in our vehicles in the future, and they were keeping it in the box to keep anybody from tampering with it. The bonus they told me about, if I completed this trip without damage to the package, was more than enough to seal the deal for me. So I drove around with my little black box. I kept it with me on the passenger seat. I wanted to have my eyes on it, obviously. When I stopped for lunch, I started to doubt my GPS theory, though, because after spending time with it, I could tell that the package was humming. As I was sitting there in my seat, working my way through a slice of pizza, I kept glancing over at the box, and I almost jumped out of the van when it vibrated. I nearly dropped my slice, and for a few seconds I was convinced that I had been tricked into smuggling a bomb on board my van. When it didn't explode, I figured I was overreacting because it stopped humming once I finished my meal. In my mind, I joked with myself that the box was just hungry, envious of my lunch break. Either that or else it was impatient and wanted to get back on the road. For some reason, that idea stuck with me. Was this package keeping its own schedule? I then returned back to the distribution facility at the end of the day, and a different supervisor retrieved the box from my vehicle. They thanked me for a job well done and carried the package out of sight. As I handed it to them, I asked what it was. I even pitched my GPS theory. The question earned me a glare and a long period of silence. I quickly apologized and left for the day. That reaction now had me determined, though. I was now wanting to find out what was inside that box. I spoke to the other drivers and I learned pretty quickly which of them had already given the box a tour of their delivery route. So that narrowed down who would be escorting the package next. I kept my eye on those drivers who would be next. I then watched as one of them received the box and drove it around without incident. The next driver, however, was not so lucky. I arrived at the facility early that afternoon. I had rushed through my deliveries and skipped lunch so that I could arrive before this next driver. I wanted to see him hand off the box. Instead, when he pulled in, I watched as he jumped out of his driver's seat, screaming. I kept my distance. I ducked into my own van and I hunched down a bit behind the windshield. I wanted to watch as best as I could, but I did not want to get caught. I watched as the frantic driver was tackled by security. I didn't even know we had security that could deal with that kind of thing. They pinned him to the ground and bound his hands. And might I say that they looked very professional while doing it. That driver was then carried away, hogtied. I guess they even knocked him unconscious somehow. And then next I watched as my supervisors rushed into his truck and brought out the box. I could see from my seat that the black cardboard had been torn open. They were all obviously scared. They were all on their cell phones and moving so hurriedly that I wasn't surprised when two of them collided. This caused the box to fall, and I could see something tumble out. It was shaped like a small pyramid. Most of it was silver, the color of steel, and the way the light hit it, I'm confident that it was metal. But what I could not understand were the veins. These thin green streaks ran across the surface of this pyramid thing. It looked like a leaf or thinly stretched skin. The streaks were pulsating too, throbbing. Watching it made my head ache. Whatever it was was scooped back into its box and the team of supervisors all scurried off to their offices. Someone was going to be upset with them, I could tell. But I could also tell that the pyramid thing was not ours. It didn't look like any piece of technology that I had ever seen, and plenty had passed through my hands. When the other driver, the one who broke the box, didn't come back to work, I knew something was very wrong. 
I knew my company was hiding something. I instantly decided to quit and I let things get quiet. But your channel, Lilith, has given me a unique opportunity. I've taken all the measures I need to stay safe. And I think that you and your followers deserve to know about this. You can spread the word and you can warn others without endangering me. I think the big corporations out there are working for somebody else. Maybe the government, maybe something even bigger. I think that they're driving around and scanning our cities. I think they're preparing for something and I don't know what it is. I just know that if I stay silent, none of us will be ready for it. My name is Randy, and I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. I saw and experienced some strange things growing up. One day when I was 10 years old in the summer of 1981, I was just walking through the old hood when one of my friends came running out of his house and asked me if I had seen what he called the hyena dog. I told him no, that I had never seen anything that looked like a hyena, so he went on to tell me about his dad seeing it and how it tried to kill one of his cats. I didn't think much of it until a couple of weeks later when I was walking home and I saw this ginormous humpbacked thing about 10 foot off the wood line in the woods. It sure enough was colored like a hyena, but it was big. There were about two square acres of woods between where I was standing to my driveway. I just froze because I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't see any legs or the head because of the underbrush and apparently it had its head down, possibly eating something. I was not about to walk past this ginormous creature, but all of a sudden, anyway, it just took off like a streak of lightning. As soon as it was gone, I ran as fast as I could to my house. When I got home, I told my mom and dad about it and they said that my uncle Fred, who lived across the street from us, had seen it and then it had killed his white Persian cat. My Uncle Fred was a retired USMC gunnery sergeant and quite a badass. Dad said that my Uncle Fred was on the warpath. My uncle had a Saturday morning ritual of shooting handguns down on our land because there was nothing but woods behind us. Every Saturday, as soon as I ate breakfast, I shot out the back door to go down to where he was shooting guns, hoping he would let me shoot one. This day, when I got to the end of the porch, I heard one hell of a gun blast coming from my uncle's yard. My dad yelled for me to get in the house. I didn't know what was going on, but I was already about ten feet off the back porch watching my uncle Fred running down the hill yelling. Yelling, I blew that thing's head off. My dad was an ex-marine too, and he didn't play around much when he told me to do something. He yelled my name again and told me to get back inside the house. I walked back up to the porch and Mom walked out to meet me. We watched my uncle walk down from his yard to the road and he stopped maybe 20 feet from whatever he shot. My dad walked toward the feed pile that my Uncle Fred had set up to trap this creature and he stopped maybe 30 feet away. My dad asked my Uncle Fred what he had shot and my Uncle Fred said, The heck if I know, it's ugly. Dad turned around and saw me and Mom on the porch and told us to get back in the house because we didn't need to be any part of what was going on. Mom pushed me on in the back door as we waited for Dad to come back from whatever he and my uncle were doing. So my dad gets back about three hours later and he was not acting his normal self. I asked him what Uncle Fred shot and he told me Uncle Fred did not shoot anything and not to ever mention it again. I spent a lot of time over at my Uncle Fred's because he lived just across the street, so I asked him what he shot, and he said he didn't know what I was talking about. But when I got home, I got a pretty good whooping for asking him, and my dad told me to forget anything to do with that day. A couple of years later, I got into some big time camping in those woods, and we would always hear crazy sounds. Sometimes it was like a baby crying, and other times it sounded like a woman screaming but it scared the hell out of me and my friends. We left the woods more than once because of those noises, and my dad said it was just bobcats and that they wouldn't hurt anything. So one night, me and my friends were camping about half a mile back in the woods in a high spot above a creek that was maybe 150 yards away. We heard that freaky baby crying sound coming up the hill towards where we were. 
It was really cold that night because we only camped out in the winter, but we did have heavy-duty army sleeping bags. We had a good-sized fire built, and I had my dad's semi-automatic 22 with me, and I figured if something came up on the campsite, I was just going to shoot it. I turned around to look at my friend, and he was building all these little itty-bitty fires all around his sleeping bag. I asked him what he was doing and if he had heard those sounds. He said, yeah, he heard them, and they were going to have to run through fire to get to him. I told him he was a moron, and I turned back towards the fire. That's when I saw two great big tall ears and two great big eyes, and I did not hesitate to shoot. But to say that my reflexes kicked into overdrive is an understatement because I was 50 yards away before my friend had a chance to sit up. He yelled for me to wait for him as he ran through the woods to catch me. I didn't even bother to bring a flashlight because I figured if something was crazy enough to come up on that fire, I didn't want any of it. We came out of the woods about 100 yards from my back porch and Dad was on the porch waiting for us, wanting to know why I had discharged my gun in the middle of the night. I told him a bobcat had come up to the campfire, and he started laughing. All of a sudden, you could hear the loud baby crying sound right on top of where we were camping. I looked up at my dad, and he had a seriously concerned look on his face, which was not common for my dad. He told us to go down in the basement and to spend the rest of the night down there. We went back to get our camping stuff the next morning, and nothing was bothered. We didn't hear any crazy sounds or anything, so we got our stuff and we left. The thing about what I shot at is this. In my head, I thought it was a bobcat because it was all ears and eyes, but I never thought about how high they were off the ground. The eyes had to be at least three feet up, and that's no bobcat. I did not realize this until I heard so many different dogman stories. Was it a dogman? I don't know, but I don't see bobcats walking up to a campfire, and after those days passed, I never ran from anything else that came upon a campfire again. I lost track of how many times I heard those crazy crying sounds or a scream in those woods, but when we did, we got the hell out of there fast. We always just thought it was bobcats, and I didn't get a good enough picture of what I saw to say for sure that it was a bobcat, but like I said, its eyes were a good three feet off the ground. So as the years go by and my Uncle Fred passes away, my dad and I spend a lot of time together, and I had already been moved out on my own for a couple of years. My dad would call me at least twice a week, if not more, just to go for a ride or to get something to eat. We were pretty close. So one day we were driving and talking about Uncle Fred and how crazy he was. We were laughing at some of the wild things he did throughout the years, and I remembered him shooting at that thing we called the hyena dog. I asked Dad about it, and he pulled off the side of the road the second I questioned him about it. He gripped the steering wheel real tight, and he told me he had already warned me about asking him about what happened that day. I was a little bit like my Uncle Fred, and I told him I didn't really care about what he told me 13 years ago, because back then I was a little boy, and now I wanted to know what happened. He looked at me, and his face was white as a ghost, and he said, Boy, I don't know what that was, but it was not anything natural. I asked him what he meant, and he said that he didn't want to ever talk about it, and for me to please never ask him again. My dad was fearless, but this had scared him. After listening to hundreds of different dogman stories over the years, I believe that my uncle killed one and that he and my dad buried it. I think it was probably one of those hyena-type dogmen. All I know is what I experienced, and it was exceptionally strange, and I was young. In the years since then, all the land behind where I grew up was developed, and we never heard those crazy screams or cries ever again. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Do what you will with it. I know it's not typical, but what is typical when dealing with a possible cryptid? I spent a few years working on a cattle ranch in South Dakota. It was near the Badlands, but not near enough to be scenic. The land was flat, rolling prairies. There were groves of trees in the areas, but for the most part, nothing but open sky. The pay wasn't great, but housing was included. I was in my early 20s, so it was a good enough setup for me. 
Now, I was never one of those people who believed in the paranormal or the supernatural or any of that stuff. I was never religious. I only believed in things that I could see, hear, and touch. Despite my skeptical nature, I always liked listening to local myths and legends, but I never searched for truth in any of them. One such legend was that of the Thunder Horse. It's an old Sioux story to explain the origin of storms. Supposedly, this Thunder Horse was some ancient creature that used to roam the plains of the Midwest. The creature was described as being from a time long in the past. The Thunder Horse, for some reason, disappeared from the plains, but every once in a while, it would return to hunt bison. The sound of its hooves made thunder as it chased its prey across the plains. As the herd of bison ran, their hooves would strike rocks and send sparks across the sky. That was the lightning. From what I remember of the story, people wouldn't often witness the Thunder Horse, but they would find its bones from time to time. Sometimes the ranch hands would hang out together in the evenings after work and tell local legends like this one. We would talk about our families, silly memories of our youth, and how much work sucked. More often than not, we ended up talking about our animal encounters in the wild. Who had seen bears, wolves, moose, bobcats? None of us had ever seen a mountain lion. There was a ranch hand that was with us for only a few weeks. I'll call him Cole for the sake of the story. He was a quiet guy, maybe a little strange, but he was a hard worker. I never had any problem with him. I knew he didn't like storms and would stay indoors at night if there was any possibility of rain. Pretty odd for someone who works outdoors, but I didn't want to pry. Cole really didn't like to talk unless he had to. On the rare occasions he would hang out with us after work, he just sort of sat there and listened. One night we were talking about the bison herds in Custer State Park. I don't remember how the conversation got there, but Cole asked us if we knew the legend of the Thunder Horse. He was sitting there opposite me across the fire and wrapped in a wool blanket. I didn't know Cole well, and he was sometimes hard to get a read on, but he looked afraid in that moment. He told us that he saw a Thunder Horse one time. It was in the middle of a storm, and he said it was the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. I don't think any of us believed him, but the rest of the guys thought he was strange enough that they kept their thoughts to himself. Cole left us a couple of weeks later. I don't know if he quit or was fired. He was just gone one day, and we didn't think anything more about it. The following summer, I had all but forgotten about Cole. We had a raging thunderstorm pass through the plains. The weather radar said it was going to be a bad one. We typically leave our horses outside 24-7, but the winds were predicted to be ungodly, so we were setting up panels in the barns to make stalls for all of them. We were cutting it close, getting the barn ready in time. The rain was already pelting me as I was leading the last of the horses in, and looking at the winds, I would be surprised if the roofs were still on all the buildings come morning. I could see the cattle pasture out of the corner of my eye. I couldn't see it well because of the weather, but I could tell that they were upset. I figured it was the storm, but there wasn't much I could do for them except hope that they didn't bust down the fence. A flash of lightning lit up the sky, and I saw what was upsetting the cattle. The two horses I was leading spooked and got away from me, and I didn't blame them. There was a beast in the cattle pasture that stood about eight feet high, and it looked prehistoric. That's the only way I can think to describe it. I only saw it during flashes of lightning. It had hooves, but it looked more like a giant rhinoceros than it did a horse. It looked like something you would find roaming the earth in a time with mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. Its hair was pure white, and it was longer than a horse's hair, and kind of shaggy. It was about the size of a moose, but it was like no other animal I had ever seen. I saw it maybe six times when the lightning lit up the sky and allowed me to get a good look at the beast. The next flash of lightning, and it was gone. I thought I had some type of a hallucination, but then I remembered Cole's story. I so wish I knew where he ended up because I would love to talk to him about all of this. Now I can't explain what the Thunder Horse actually is or where it came from, or if that's even what I saw. For all I know, it could have been some prehistoric ghost. Does anybody out there know anything about this?
It was 1997, and I was camping with my sister at Craig Lake State Park in northern Michigan, up on the UP. It was the middle of summer, and unfortunately we were expecting a heat wave on the exact week of our trip. We had both taken off from work already, so we decided to go anyway and try to enjoy it. We planned to sleep in our hammocks, and we brought bug nets to hang above them. If you've never been to the Midwest, we have mosquitoes here that are just huge. We brought a tent, too, as it looked like we might have a little rain in the middle of the week. But neither of us wanted to sleep in a tent when the nighttime temperatures didn't look like it was going to get below 80. Our campsite was a hike-in spot, but it was only about four miles from the parking lot. We were both sweating buckets by the time we hauled all of our gear to the site, and I wondered if we would be able to survive the week or if we would roast alive. Most of the week went fine. Very hot and a little miserable, but we didn't run into anything strange. When I hear people tell stories like this, and there's almost always something they missed in hindsight, but here, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing at all. On the fifth day, it had begun to rain about halfway through the day. It started out as a little rain, but got significantly worse as the day progressed. It was just starting to get bad as we returned from our morning hike, so we took down our hammocks and we set up the tent. By dinner time, it was pouring. We obviously couldn't get a fire started, so we cooked dinner in the vestibule on a little butane stove. The tent had started leaking about an hour or so later, and then the wind picked up. There was a pool of water on the floor of our tent when we decided that we would rather hike the four miles back to the car. We figured we could probably find a hotel room in town, and if not, at least we could be dry in the car. The trail to the parking lot was well marked, and we should have easily found our way back. The rain and the wind were making it hard to see, so when we thought we saw the red taillights of another car, we headed straight for it. It looked exactly like taillights, bright red and glowing in the distance. It looked maybe 60 or 70 feet away from where we were on the trail. The trail had gotten soupy from all the rain, and it became difficult to tell if we were on it or not. We tried to use the light as a guide to follow back to the parking lot, but we ended up stepping directly into a swamp. The sudden change in footing surprised us both, and we both fell forward into the mud. It was that sticky type of mud that holds you in. I don't think it was quicksand, but it was difficult to get out of. When we had climbed back onto the trail, we sat there on the ground just staring at this light that appeared to be dead center in this swamp. My sister was worried that it was a car that might have driven off the road, but it wasn't sinking, and we didn't hear anybody screaming for help. I didn't know what it was, but something felt off about the whole situation. If it was a car, it's not like we would be able to help them anyway. I mean, we barely got ourselves out of the mud. We continued on in the direction that we hoped was the parking lot, and we decided that we would call the police about the possible stuck car when we got back to ours. The rain got heavier, if that was even possible, and the strange red light faded off into the distance. Then not more than ten minutes later, we saw another light, red, about three feet off the ground. It looked just like the tail light of a car. This time it was in the middle of a forest. I recognized this area. We were almost to the parking lot, but this particular area was heavily wooded. No way a car would fit in here, in the trees. I said it can't be a car, that it must be a person with a red lantern or red headlight. My sister called out to see if anybody needed help, but no answer. So my sister wanted to go in there and see what it was, but I definitely did not. But the longer I stared at that light, the more I wanted to investigate it, too. I felt strange watching it, almost like I was in a trance. And then the light moved, and it dropped to the ground, and it was now maybe just a foot or so off the ground... And then we watched as it came towards us, slithering like a snake through the trees. I had this overwhelming sense of dread. My sister and I didn't need to say anything to each other. We just ran. I looked back to see the red light following us, but then it stopped when it got to the edge of the trail. I never did figure out what it was. My sister didn't have any explanation for it either. We did call the non-emergency police line when we got back to our car, and we reported a car possibly stuck in the swamp. But she and I both knew that whatever was out there was not a taillight from a car. We both knew it was something 
real, something alive, but we still don't know what. Hi, Lilith. When I think back on this experience, I can hardly believe it happened to me. I wasn't the type of person who had ever given much thought to UFOs or anything else of that nature. I usually had my hands full with whatever I was dealing with right here on Earth. This happened in the early 2000s, not long after 9-11, so it especially freaked me out because I think at that time we were all hypersensitive about things happening in the air. The person I was dating at the time, who is now my ex, wanted to get away from civilization one night. We picked up a few snacks and drinks and we drove to an undeveloped beach in the middle of nowhere in the Gulf of Mexico. We parked with the bed of the truck facing the water, just like we always did. We had some blankets and pillows, and sometimes we would just stay out there all night. So we were sitting in the bed of the truck. It was late at night, and it was very dark with clear skies. There was no moon, and I was laying back, gazing up at what seemed to be a million stars. I distinctly remember how many stars there were that night. It was unbelievable. So we were chatting and eating, and then we both just drifted off into our own thoughts. And after a while, I realized that my ex had fallen asleep. I sat up and I was watching the lights on the offshore drilling platforms out in the water. And then I started to notice two red lights high up, moving slowly across the sky. One was directly above the other. They came down quite a bit lower and then they stopped. And the top light started moving independently of the bottom light. It was making very sharp angled turns, switching back on itself abruptly. It wasn't behaving like any aircraft I had ever seen before. It lasted for just a few minutes, just kind of going crazy. I had no idea what to think. I guess I assumed it was just something military. Then the other light that had been stationary just kind of burst apart, and I saw six purplish-blue lights form themselves into a slight arch. At that point, I woke up my ex. He thought he was dreaming at first. The purplish lights stayed still for about a minute, and then each one started slowly lowering down closer to the water. But they also looked like they were coming closer to shore, like closer to us. We started feeling a little uncomfortable. They were all slowly following this arched trajectory. And then the original one, the crazy moving one, started coming toward us and it picked up speed for a while until it suddenly came to this dead stop. The other six lights had stayed in the shape of an arch and they came to a stop behind the first. It seemed like that one in the front was some kind of a scout or something. And then the one I'm calling a scout started making this zigzag motion across the sky at a fairly regular pace. The light would reach its pinnacle of motion in one direction and without decelerating it would change directions. It could move in any direction without slowing down at all. It had to be something alien since I didn't know how any human could survive the G-forces that must have been involved in such fast and wide turns. And then it came back, and it centered itself in front of the other lights again. We climbed out of the truck bed and we were just staring up. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't hear any noise at all either. For a long time, everything just stayed really still. And then they all started blinking, on and off, pretty rapidly while they got closer and lower. At that point, we made an unspoken decision to get back in the cab of the truck. We both felt like we should drive away. We started heading back the way we had come, and we were both talking at once, trying to make it make sense. And then we started to hear a sound like speaker feedback. We thought it was the truck speakers, but they were off. And then the sound was getting progressively louder... And then I looked up through the moonroof and I saw the seven lights in formation directly above us. And that's when the sound of the static became almost deafening. At that point, we were fully panicked and thinking that they were after us personally. The noise didn't sound like engines at all. It was like an electronic noise. They passed overhead and I think they veered off to the east. It was hard to tell exactly where they were once they changed directions. Now, I've been to plenty of air shows, and I've observed a lot of military aircraft, and this was completely different. We thought it was over, and we were feeling relieved, but then all of a sudden, this blinding light came out of nowhere and hovered right over us as we drove. We were both too shocked to even speak, 
The light looked as if you could reach out and touch it, but in reality, I bet it was about 100 feet above us. It stayed in place there for about a minute until it started to slowly move up and away from us. At that point, it split in two and then reverted back to the original two red lights that I had seen in the beginning. And then the top light moved back above the bottom light and they blinked out at the same time, just gone. And that was it. It ended just like that so abruptly. But we were on edge for a long time afterwards, thinking that it was just going to crazily reappear again. If I was rich, though, I think I would pay to see that again. I've never seen anything like it, and I can't explain what I saw, and I'll probably never know where it came from or what its purpose was. I just have to spend the rest of my days wondering. This is a story that happened to me a few years ago during the winter. I wasn't really sure who to tell it to until now. I used to be a drawbridge operator. You know, I'm talking about the kind of bridges that can open in the middle so that large boats and ships can pass through. I worked on a bridge right outside of a busy vacation town, and so, in the summertime, the bridge opened up quite a bit. When a vessel was making its way either in, from, or out to the ocean, it would have to radio in to request for the bridge to be opened. We tried not to disrupt the flow of traffic too much, so we would batch the requests together and open the bridge every 20 minutes or so. There was a Coast Guard station right near the bridge. The perimeter there was heavily fenced off, and from what I heard, they took any trespassing incidents very seriously. They had a few smaller 20-foot craft as well as one of those big cutters, like a 100-foot or something. That one I had never actually seen leave the dock. In contrast to the summer, in the winter, the town took on a complete transformation. Almost all of the shops and restaurants closed, and all of the various boating and fishing rental places went off to Florida. Traffic basically dropped down to zilch, and the bridge might only open three or four times a day to accommodate the few commercial fishermen in the area. Coincidentally, I got a lot of reading done in the winter. It was one of those cold winter days in January when my incident took place. I had just started my shift. I was on nights for the next two weeks. I was going over the previous operator's log notes, just typical details on the comings and goings of vessels and ship openings, when I noticed an outbound log for that big Coast Guard cutter, along with a bunch of their smaller boats and the two tugs that they had. It was a little bit of a surprise, as it would take a few dozen people to man all of those craft. There were no maydays or distress calls being broadcast, so I figured maybe they were doing some kind of a drill or exercise. I was working my way through George Orwell's animal farm at the time, and I was completely engrossed in the story. That's why, a few hours later, I missed the first call over the radio. As soon as I realized it, I popped my headset on quickly, asking for them to repeat their message. It was the captain of that big Coast Guard cutter. I was told that the bridge needed to be opened in exactly 13 minutes, and that it would need to stay open until I was given directions to lower it. This wouldn't have been an issue anyway, since fewer than six cars had crossed the bridge all night, but military and law enforcement were entitled to passage through the canal as they needed it. Anyway, they called in with the ETA, so when the time got close, I logged the communication and I opened the bridge. Looking out over the water, I could start to see the bow lights of a little fleet of ships. It would end up being six in total, including the cutter, two tugboats, and three other small craft. The smaller vessels were paced out about 500 feet behind the cutter. Directly behind the cutter were the two tugboats, almost side by side. The operator room was about 70 or 80 feet away from where the bridge opened, but there was a camera system which constantly recorded the area around and beneath the bridge. Boating collisions happen more often than you'd think. So as the cutter passed beneath the bridge and passed one of the cameras, I could make out a few dozen people aboard the craft. And I couldn't believe it at first, but about half of them looked to be holding nasty-looking assault rifles. And then the tugboats came next. It was the middle of the night, and water visibility here is poor, but I could just make out the thick tow ropes trailing into the water behind the tugs. 
and attached to them was something unbelievably long. It was hard to tell, but whatever it was looked smooth with almost a greenish hue to what I could see was a scaly texture. And just by how much time it took for the thing to pass by the camera, I had to guess that it was at least 200 feet long. And I'm not even sure that I saw the end of it before what happened next. I'm not sure if it was because of the lights on the bridge or the underwater noise of the props bouncing off the nearby concrete, but the long thing started moving, slowly kind of swaying back and forth beneath the bridge. One of the guys on the tugboat started yelling out loud, and I could see the small craft was straining to maintain its straight path. The three smaller boats in the back started gunning in towards the tugs, kicking up tons of wake. The water started exploding violently all throughout the canal in an area a few hundred feet long. On camera, I could see that one of the tow cables from a tugboat snapped. And now that it was no longer restrained, the tug shot forward, slamming into one of the bridge pilings. I heard a quick round of pops, followed by another, and I ran over to the door of the office and pushed it open. From my vantage point, I could see the small boats in the rear of the convoy speeding up to the tugs, but giving the erupting water a wide berth. Two or three of the guys were actually shooting at that long thing in the water. The other tug, now bearing the full burden, looked like a fishing bobber getting dragged across the surface. At one or two points, it looked like it might even dip beneath the water. The cutter was trying hard to come around, but the bridge didn't give it any room. It was hard to tell how it happened, but somehow the line from the other tug snapped just as a massive snake-like tail erupted out of the water near one of the smaller boats, slamming down on the edge of it and causing it to tip. I watched as I could see the crew fly up and out into the water. And then that was it. The gunshots stopped, but the shouts continued for at least a minute longer. One of the other boats went to pick up the floating crew of the tipped boat, and the other craft fell back into the loose semi-formation. The tipped boat was just making its way out to sea as the little convoy headed in the direction of the Coast Guard station. The creature, or whatever it was, didn't resurface again. I dropped the bridge and I just plopped into my seat at the desk. 20 minutes later, I was trying to collect my thoughts, trying to figure out what had happened, when I saw a black SUV driving over the bridge and stopped right in front of the operating room. Two men got out of the vehicle and they walked right in without knocking. One was wearing a typical Coast Guard uniform and carrying a rifle in his hands, and the other was wearing a style of uniform that I couldn't recognize. The second man introduced himself simply as Colonel Wex. He told me to recount the events that I had just witnessed, so I did. He then asked a bunch of questions like if I had recorded anything or contacted anybody. I told him no but that the bridge utilized the camera system. He told me I had to hand over my phone and I would receive it back in the mail in a few days. I thought about refusing, but the guy with the gun changed my mind. He finished by telling me that I was relieved for the night and that I should get a call from my supervisor soon that would confirm it. I didn't say anything else. I grabbed my stuff and I headed home. My supervisor did call me while I was driving and he sounded just as confused as me but he told me that I had the next week off, with double pay. He called back a few days later and he told me that a new position for a higher paying job, an administrative job, just opened. And refusal wasn't an option. So, here I am, now working, that new job. By the way, I never did get my phone back. I don't know if I can get in trouble for repeating any of this, but I guess I will soon find out. I know it sounds like complete BS, but it really did happen. I also know that if anybody will believe this insane experience, it'll be you and your listeners. I don't have a personal encounter per se, but I believe this story should be told nonetheless. And I'm curious if anybody else out there has had a similar experience or has seen anything in the wild that they can't explain. My tale starts at a history museum in the Western United States. I used to work there for quite a while. I don't want to say the name of the museum, but I will say that we were near the Rocky Mountains. My personal area of study was prehistoric. 
I quite liked the challenge of trying to piece things together from a time before written records. You have to be both a scientist and a historian to get things right. And even then, some things still remain a mystery despite your best efforts. After spending eight years on my education, I taught for several years and I did many field studies. I didn't expect I would end up working at a museum, but I can't complain too much. We had quite an extensive collection of artifacts from various ages of prehistory. I loved cataloging items in the archives as well as answering questions from curious minds. All types of people would come to the museum, but I admit that I was quite surprised to see two local park rangers in their uniforms waiting for me at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. They wanted to know my thoughts on a couple of ancient tools. That's not typically abnormal. Sometimes people will find artifacts and bring them in. The rangers had brought me two fluted spear points and a scrapper. I remember them well. They were made in the Clovis style. The rangers didn't want to tell me at first where they were found, but I started to put the pieces together, and eventually they told me the story. And it was quite a story at that. There had been a few sightings of wild men in remote locations around the mountains both in the United States and in Canada. I'm not talking about national parks or heavily populated hiking trails, but instead backpackers who head way off marked trails. People exploring deep into the wilderness, often in near untouched areas. The rangers that patrolled this particular area had received a report from two hikers who claimed to have seen a wild looking man in the backcountry with no gear. The area was surrounded by miles of wilderness with no access roads nearby. The hikers recorded the GPS coordinates of where they saw the man and reported it to the ranger station. The rangers investigated this particular incident, and after a long search, they found a cave with a primitively built structure around the outside. Something similar to a hut or a lean-to with a woven roof is the way they described it. They said they found these tools in the cave along with several others and there were signs of recent human activity. I had to check my calendar to see if this was an April Fool's joke. It would have been a great one, but the rangers were dead serious. The tools they had presented me were near identical recreations of the Clovis style of tools found in America around 13,000 years ago. I still didn't quite believe them though. I'm quite skeptical of an unknown population's ability to remain hidden in the wilderness for so many years without any contact with the modern world. Why haven't we had more sightings of these wild people? And if they're out there, what exactly are they? The tools certainly looked Clovis, but the Clovis people disappeared around 9,000 years ago. The rangers both theorized that they could be responsible for the Sasquatch sightings that seemed to be prevalent throughout the continent. I think there's more to it than that, but I don't have any plausible theories myself. I asked the rangers to bring me to the site, but they refused. Imagine what we could learn from these people if they actually do exist out there. There are so many things that we don't know about their culture. We could learn what language they spoke. I can't really explain what an incredible find this would be for us historians. If the story's true, these people sound like they're living just like they were roughly 13,000 years ago, when they were hunting mammoths and mastodons across the plains. I imagine they must still be hunting big game with those fluted spear points. I do understand the rangers' reservations, though. If such a thing got out, I don't imagine it would go well for the wild people. They likely have no immunity to our diseases, and I don't suppose they would welcome us with open arms should we try to find them. But I can't tell you how badly I wanted to see that site. I would have done anything. Both of the rangers said the sightings were in extremely remote areas, so remote that it was surprising to even find hikers there. And they hope to leave whatever or whoever is living out there alone for the time being. Their curiosity got the best of them, so they found me. I was the verification they needed. This experience happened to me about 15 years ago now, and I still think about it quite often. I found myself taking long hiking trips in remote locations across the continent, but I haven't yet had a sighting of my own. If they are indeed out there, and this wasn't an elaborate prank, they're keeping themselves very well hidden. They're doing it very well. I've never told this story before. 
I didn't think anyone would believe me. I know it sounds crazy, but it happened, and it's the reason I never go hiking alone in the woods anymore. There are a few public hiking trails near my house in northern Illinois. The local state park is divided across a river. The more populated side has a swimming beach and a bunch of picnic areas, while the other side of the park is pretty secluded. Not many people know about the other side of the park. It's roughly a five-mile drive from the main entrance. You have to get back on the country road and head south until you reach another dirt road. It doesn't even have a road sign and there are weeds growing down the middle of the road between the wear of the tire tracks. You drive down the dirt road for about two miles and there's a parking lot on your left. Blink and you'll miss it. The parking lot is just a gravel lot surrounded by an old wooden fence. There's room for about four vehicles, but I rarely ever saw anybody else there. A little brown sign posted at the edge of the fence states that you're entering state park land and to pay any fees at the main park office. There's only one trail on this side of the park, and it's a six-mile loop that winds through mostly wooded area. The trail passes through a couple of prairies, but they aren't terribly large. I preferred this side of the park because I fancied myself an amateur photographer and there were more opportunities to take nature photos over here. I was particularly interested in taking photos of songbirds and I would always see a greater variety on this trail than I would anywhere else, especially the main part of the park. I don't know how many times I hiked that trail, it must have been nearly a hundred, and I never once felt anything strange there. But then again, I always stayed on the trail. Once in a while, I would venture maybe 10 yards into the woods to get a good photo, but that was it. Like I said, I was an amateur. I wasn't looking for National Geographic. A smaller trail split off from the main trail deep in the woods. You could tell it was definitely not part of the State Park Trail, but it had been well-traveled. I never saw anybody on it, but I very rarely ever saw anybody else out there at all. My experience happened in late July. I had just gotten off work and I wanted to get some photos in the evening light, so I headed out to my secluded trail. The sun sets about 9 p.m. in the summer, so I definitely had plenty of time after work to hike that trail and to be back to the car before dark. My hike seemed normal enough, but when I got to the part where that small trail started, I noticed that it was roped off. The park service had posted a sign that said, Hidden Falls area closed due to erosion damage. Keep out. Now I had heard about Hidden Falls, but I never knew exactly where it was before that day. It was just a tiny waterfall that led into the river, but it wasn't anywhere on the map. I know I should have listened to the sign, but I wanted to see the waterfall for myself. And of course, it could be a good photo opportunity. So down the trail I went. I didn't notice any erosion damage on the way down, but I had never been on that trail before, so I didn't really have anything to compare to. The trail led almost straight down and the foliage became denser, so much so that it was difficult carrying my camera bag through it. The brush was so thick that I could hear the waterfall well before I saw it. The forest suddenly opened up, and there it was. Hidden Falls was aptly named. It was only about three quarters of a mile from the main trail, but you would never have even known it was there. It was almost magical, like somewhere straight out of a fairy tale. The evening sunlight pierced through the trees and lit up the falling water, so I immediately pulled out my camera and began taking photos. I was only there for about ten minutes when I heard laughing. It didn't sound exactly like a human voice, though. There was something off about it. I looked around and I couldn't see anybody else. I called out and said, who's there? But I didn't get a response. I started to pack up my camera then when I heard the laugh again. And this time it sounded like it was coming from the stream itself. I listened closer and I was certain it was at the stream. I stuffed my camera back into my bag and I wanted to get the hell out of there, but just as I stood up to leave, it had suddenly gotten dark. And I don't mean dark like the sun was setting. I mean dark like the middle of the night. I looked at my watch and it said 6.45 and I knew I had about two hours of sunlight left. But it was dark. I could see stars through the gaps in the trees. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right and I had to get myself back to the car as fast as I could. 
I got on the trail heading out and luckily used my cell phone as a flashlight. As I climbed out, I heard the laughing again, but this time it sounded like it was coming from the trees. So I shone my light at the trees, but couldn't see anything there. Only the dark outlines of branches and leaves. But then I caught it, a pair of eyes reflecting back at me. They stared at me for a moment, and then the laughing began again. I held the light towards the creature, and it showed itself for just a moment. It ducked from beneath some branches and stood there in the light. It was a coyote, standing about 30 feet up a tree. It looked at me, tilted its head, and it smiled. But not like a dog smile. I don't quite know how to describe it, but I knew it wasn't a coyote then, even though it looked like one. Its eyes were reflecting the light from my phone, so I couldn't just see what it looked like. At least not exactly. I didn't stay there long either because as soon as it revealed itself, it laughed again, and I ran. I could barely see where I was going, but I didn't care. I knew I needed to get away. I tripped over the rope at the beginning of the trail, and I have never felt such relief. The sky was light again, and it was as if nothing had happened. You won't be surprised to hear that I never went back to that park, and I never figured out just what that coyote actually was or what it wanted. I'm not even sure I want to know, to be truthful. But no one can tell me that the park service doesn't know that that thing exists. There wasn't any noticeable erosion damage on that trail. That sign was definitely put there to keep people away, to keep people from meeting that creature. 